Now, in our first three Sundays at looking at 1 Thessalonians, in chapter 1, we saw that Paul was writing to a church that was doing extremely well. He had nothing to add that they were not doing well. It was a vibrant church. It was doing extremely well. And it brought Paul much joy in his prayers. They also had questions that they were asking that he was responding to, several things, but also including the return of Christ. They were worried about what had happened to those who had died before Christ came again. In the first 12 chapters of, excuse me, 12 verses of chapter 2, we looked at several aspects of the ministry of Paul to the Thessalonians. Specifically, we looked at the why and the how and the heart of his ministry to those in Thessalonica. And then in verses 13 to 16, we saw where the Thessalonians had accepted the scriptures. They had heard God's word, they were believing, and the Holy Spirit was seen to be at work in Thessalonica. So as we do here in community, would you please stand with me for the reading of God's word and for prayer. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 17. But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again. But Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. For, in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened and as you know. For this reason, what I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you, and our labor might be in vain. Aaron Ross, would you please pray for us today? Please be seated. Now today we're going to talk an awful lot about family, and I think it's interesting that Pastor Steve Monique, on their way back from Colorado, camped out in Topeka, and that's actually where I was born. I was born at Forbes Air Force Base when it was still an Air Force Base, way back in the mid-1960s. See how I did that? The mid-60s. And so uh, my mom was from Kansas, my dad's from the south side of Chicago. Now, my family was raised differently because my dad was in the Air Force for several years before I was born. And so we, we moved all the time. Because of that, uh, I had very little contact with my dad's side of the family. In fact, I only met my grandparents twice. I met him once in 1970 when my dad came back from Vietnam on one of the mid-tours. And we took a train up to Chicago. And once when my grandmother discovered she had Alzheimer's and she said, we're going to Arizona. And I saw him then when I was about 17. Mom's side of the family saw a lot more because every time my dad went to uh, Takli, Tansanud, uh, and a host of other places for year remotes, uh, we'd always move back to Kansas. And so because of that, visiting grandma's house, my mom's side of the family, was exciting. It was great. Behind her house, she had one of those one-of-a-kind hamburger drive-ins called King's. You're not finding it anywhere else. That's it. They had a Dairy Queen. Our classrooms are bigger, one classroom is bigger than the Dairy Queen. It was a walk up, that's it. No seating, no anything. Uh, it was ice cream and ice cream only. A local grocery store that, that it was not affiliated with anybody, but we got time to spend with family. We desired to be with our family. It was grandma's house, always wanted to be there. Now our scriptures today tell us of Paul's deep, 
care and his deep concern for the Thessalonians and his desire to be with them. So that's what we're going to talk about first. We desire to be together because we care. We read in Acts 17 this morning that Paul and the others were in Thessalonica for three Sabbaths, and they were treated with hostility by the Jews, and eventually a mob was created. The city was in an uproar. Uh, that had to be awful interesting. They ended up attacking the house of Jason. Uh, Paul and the others were taken into custody. And after they took security from Jason, that might have been bail, that might have been a down payment on repaying for damages, they were let go. And they had to leave Thessalonica. The work was unfinished. The Thessalonians were always in Paul's thoughts and prayers. He had deep feelings for them. They were Paul's children. He was praying to be with them. Just as I wanted to be with my family and hang out at my grandmother's house as a youth, Paul wanted to be with his spiritual family in Thessalonica. Now, we see the family is the core element of the Bible. Genesis 2, Adam and Eve. What does God say? Multiply. And there are many instructions in the Bible about the family. For a family to fear the Lord. Proverbs 22, train up the children, your children in holiness and in truth. Psalm 127, children are a heritage from God. The fruit of the womb is a reward. And the family is the biblical foundation of society. Now, none are perfect. They're not easy. Families have flaws, and even biblical families. I refer you back to Adam and Eve. Cain and Abel, uh, not the best relationship. Uh, if you look, if they put from 2 Samuel, David's family and his children into a soap opera today, you would watch it, and you would think it had nothing to do with the Bible. It was a soap opera, biblical style. Now, my family had flaws. There was brokenness on both sides, but still loved, still cared for. But it wasn't a family of faith. And I think we'd all agree, we've seen the family's been attacked in recent generations. Satan desires to attack and to break the family. Christians are brothers and sisters in the faith our spiritual family. And we see Satan attacking members, even to do everything he can to prevent our gathering together. So would you please turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. When you find it, make sure you keep a bookmark there because we're going to move just a bit past it really shortly. But Hebrews chapter 10, in verse, beginning in verse 24. It's hard not to look out today and see where Satan is attacking everything about the family. If you have to question who's a man and a woman, you're, going to, you're trying to dig under the foundation of a family, the foundation of who we are in Christ, who, we, who God has created us to be. So Hebrews 10, verse 24, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Now, Paul was prevented from going to Thessalonica by Satan. Why? Well, we don't know that exactly. We do know it obviously was God's will that he not go. In Acts 16, we see where Paul was forbidden by the Holy Spirit himself. And we know later that he had a vision to go to Macedonia. But Paul had deep affection for his brothers and sisters in Christ, the churches he labored in. We see this in the letter to the Philippians. In chapter 1, he wrote, how, long, how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. That's more than a, I miss you. Love you. That's deeper. How I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. From Scripture today, verse 20. For you are our glory and joy. Paul loved the Thessalonians. He cared for them. He wanted to be with them. So how do we exhibit our caring for one another? It's simple. It's sacrificial love. We were in Hebrews 10. I hope you kept your finger there or a bookmark. Go to Hebrews 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Beginning in verse 1. Therefore we also since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Verse 2. 
looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy that was set before him. Have you ever thought of joy as part of sacrificial love? I had never really considered that deeply. Joy is part of sacrificial love. The joy of serving today, yet while we still look towards eternity. Now, Jesus was sustained through the cross, through the shame and the pain, by the joy he anticipated at the end, being with his heavenly Father. We, too, offer ourselves to the Lord as a living sacrifice. Now, everyone, I hope, remembers this. Romans 12, 1. It was our memory verse. Hopefully everybody remembers this. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. How do we do this? Well, 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We love because he first loved us. So how do we live this love? One way is to care for one another. Our examples, well, we're in one of Paul's letters. Let's look at Paul. He was called to serve in places where his life was in danger. Yet he thought sharing the gospel was still an absolute necessity. Think of his companions, Silas and Timothy. Along with Paul, they risked much all the time, but they loved the churches deeply. How do we live this love? By being there for one another, in our families, in good times, in hard times, in happiness and sadness. Even when we help ha families move, we're happy to help the Bracewells move. How sad it is that we were helping the Bracewells move. When we help someone, a ride to a doctor's office, help with a home or a car repair, when we sit with someone who just had a tough discussion with a doctor. When someone's having a tough season and just needs for someone to sit in the ashes with them. All right, guys, this is hard because I didn't say our intent was to sit in the ashes so we could fix it. Guys want to fix it. Sometimes we just need to sit in the ashes and experience the loss or the lament with that person. And... How do we exhibit this love? How do we live this love? When we pray for them. We talked about sacrificial love. There's a cost in living this love, the cost of a gospel life. And we know it cost Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25. Three times I was beaten with rods, one stone. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep and onward. If you are called to this sacrifice, you may. Some are today. But what if the sacrifice were time? We have to have time to make a relationship. You can't be in a relationship with someone if you don't spend the time. And by the way, when it's needed, not when it's convenient for us. Finances, helping someone who may need it, but also remembering who ultimately provides us our finances. What about our reputations, standing up when the issue isn't popular? When I lived in Spain, I, was, I lived there from 7 to about 11. And when I was 9 or 10, we had a next-door neighbor that moved in. We lived on base. And his name was Junior. Now, Junior was mentally challenged. And so, therefore, he was not popular. He was made fun of. He was picked on horribly. Let's cut to the chase. He was picked on horribly. He really was. But he lived next door. And so I hung out with him a lot. He was a nice guy, wouldn't hurt a fly, and he just wanted to hang out with someone. And so I always did everything I could to bring him into things that we were doing, spend time with him. And let's be honest, it, I took some of that same beating because you have a friend that's not like everyone else, that can't do everything like everyone else. But you know what? He was as loyal a friend, especially for ages of 9 and 10, as you could possibly ask for. Now, when we love sacrificially, we're going to face suffering and trials and persecution. Our earthly life may be hard, but just as we read with Christ, we endure for the joy to come. How do we persevere? How do we build one another up? 
we trust in Christ, and we find joy in serving one another. So, some applications, some questions to ask. Now, in all of these, you may have an outward issue. You also may have a heart issue in these things. Because remember, doing the right thing, if our heart is not truly where it should be, that's not good. So, do we wish to do life with our brothers and sisters in the faith? Are we purposeful in knowing one another? Or are we like the cartoon characters? Morning, Ralph. Morning, Fred. How are you? I am fine. Thank you for asking. Sounds like your Spanish class growing up. How is your family? My family as well. Thank you. How is yours? And then you shake hands and go on. You have learned nothing besides that person was here today. You haven't invested. You haven't spent the time getting to know them. I've said before, I think Sunday morning many of us could earn an Academy Award because we ask, how are you doing today? And the answer is rarely anything but proud, happy to be here, proud to serve. We're having a wonderful time. Life is the best thing ever. When, let's be honest, it may not be. All of us sometimes want to put on a, a mask here. And of all places that we shouldn't have to wear a mask, and all places where we should be looking to be someone that is looking for someone that is wearing a mask. Do we care for one another? Do we encourage and strengthen one another? There are some people, and I am so glad they're out there, they can encourage you no matter what is happening. They are encouragers. It's a wonderful gift. Are we patient? Are we kind to one another? And again, do we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ? Some others that aren't up there, do we teach the truth? Do we disciple believers? Are we there for one another at all times and all situations? Am I available even when it's inconvenient? This one is hard for me. I look at my schedule a week out and it's usually pretty busy. And there's always, uh, not always, there's sometimes where it's like, oh, that's a hard phone call to that field. Military folks, 4 o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday, do you answer the phone or do you not answer the phone? Can you do these things when it's hard, when it's inconvenient? But here's a question, and Ryan asked something similar last week. That's why I thought of this. Can you think of brothers and sisters in Christ who have shown sacrificial love to you, strengthened you, encouraged you, challenged you, but most of all, been there for you. As we head towards closing, from the earlier, earliest chapters of Genesis, we see the family highlighted from Adam and Eve, and we hear Noah and his family. And I want to highlight a promise of God that happens right after Noah. So would you please turn with me to Genesis chapter 12. So we've had the flood. God has rebooted some things with Noah and his family. Now we're coming to the story of a man named Abram. This verse has a focus on the family. It mentions the biological family. It also mentions a wider family to come. Genesis chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. All the families of the earth shall be blessed. Folks, that's us today. You are living a promise that God has kept today because this includes the Gentiles. One of the things is the Jews look at this and they see Abraham, Abraham and his lineage as being blessed by God. And Abraham was truly blessed by God. But this is where we see that God's grace and his mercy and his favor will be eventually towards all the families of the earth. The Apostle Paul, he desired so much to be with his spiritual family. 
the church. His true love was the church. He had a deep concern. He cared and he prayed for them. And you read, he said he prayed daily for them. Now at CBC, we're family. We should desire to be together. Why? Because we care for one another and we are the body of Christ. We show our care, our sacrificial love towards one another. It's not self-focused. Now, it was a true sacrifice when Paul sent Timothy to see of the spiritual condition of the Thessalonians. Well, that doesn't sound too hard, except when you remember that there were no cars, there were no cell phones. It was a trip to either walk or grab a ride on an on a animal-pulled cart to get there. And once you got there, you had to have time to get to know folks, see what was going on, talk to many folks, see what's happening, be present. And then the trip home. This was not a quick trip. This wasn't a Friday night, I'll be back Monday, no problem. If you remember, Timothy was such a help to Paul. We might call, he was Paul's right-hand man. Paul was deeply dependent upon Timothy. But he still sent Timothy to see what was going on with the Thessalonians church. There's a simple way to explain it. Paul put others before himself. In Psalm 133, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. We've all been adopted into God's family. God chose us by nothing of who we were. By His grace and His mercy, we have become family, the church, the body of Christ. And as the church, we need to live life together. Living as the body of Christ, a family in the faith. And we weren't created to be alone. God saw Adam and it was not good that he was alone. He created Eve. How does Pastor Steve put it? Adam saw Eve and, wow. We weren't made to be alone. I love my John Wayne movies. Not all of them, most of them. John Wayne is not a biblical character. We're made to be in relationship with one another, and when that is not happening, we're missing something. We're missing of something in how God has designed, and how Christ has designed his church to be and to operate. We need fellowship with one another. So, Let's close today with a well-known scripture from Ecclesiastes. So would you please stand with me? Ecclesiastes chapter 4, beginning in verse 9. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, please help us to be dedicated to one another as the body of Christ, the church. Help us not to see the things which daily seek to take our minds and hearts away from our brothers and sisters in Christ, but to see what you have provided for us, our adopted family, which you have brought together. Help us to truly desire to gather and be together. Help us that we would desire to serve one another with a focus yet on the eternal. Let us truly love one another with a love that is true, one that's not envious or selfish, but a love that is enduring and does not fail. Thank you for this congregation of believers, for all those you have brought together. And I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.